Richmond, Communications and Public Affairs Coordinator at the Advisory Council on Historic Preservation. Here with me is ACHP Chairman Amy Giorgiani, Dr. Ramon Jackson, African American Heritage Coordinator for the South Carolina Department of Archives and History, and Jamie Harriet, South Carolina African American Heritage Commission Chairperson. Welcome, everyone. Well, thank you. Hey, good to be with you. We're here celebrating National Historic Preservation Month. And we wanted to talk about African-American heritage in uh, South Carolina. Dr. Jackson, can you tell me first a little bit about your background and, and what brought you to historic preservation? I recently graduated from the history department, uh, the doctoral program in history at the University of South Carolina. Uh, my advisor, Dr. Bobby Donaldson, uh, had this habit of bringing me in on a lot of different projects. Um, I had a slightly different trajectory than some of my colleagues in graduate school as a result. Um, I was fortunate to work as co-historian on a project called Columbia SC63, uh, which commemorated the 50th anniversary of the Civil Rights Movement in Columbia, South Carolina, and six other Southern cities. Um, but mainly my focus was uh, the story of African Americans uh, and their struggle for civil rights in our capital city here in South Carolina. Um, after that, I did some work over at ETV um, and then, uh, you know, just kind of finished up my program and, and, and worked outside of academia and, and, uh, for a while uh, before I was um, offered an opportunity to apply for a position at South Carolina Department of Archives and History. Uh, it, and so my role as African American Heritage Coordinator uh, I work really closely with the State Historic Preservation Office. Now, again, I'm a traditional track historian, um, so I'm, you know, I'm very good at writing journal articles. I can, I can do the, I did the dissertation. Historic preservation wasn't necessarily why I went to um, the doctoral program, but um, in many ways, this this year and a half has been kind of like, you know, joining the Marines, um, you know, just working on the ground, working closely with SHPO staff, working with uh, Miss Harriet and the commission uh, to commemorate African American historic spaces in a variety of different ways. Uh, so we do that through historical markers. Uh, we uh, help to get African American spaces listed on the National Register of Historic Space, uh, Places. Um, we also have a variety of uh, programs dealing with um, creating lesson plans and curriculum uh, development programs for teachers in the state. Uh, so I've been given really um, quite a gift uh, working for uh, archives and, and with the commission because um, I, I just think it's been a real education, not only in historic preservation, but in the variety of ways uh, that history shapes our daily lives uh, and the lives of students and, and uh, teachers around the state as well. Thanks. And Ms. Harriet, what about you? How did you, uh, what is your background and how did you come to historic preservation? Well, my background is an educator and business. I taught public school in North and South Carolina for a number of years. And then I um, moved and lived in the Northeast and I taught at a junior college as well as I worked in the corporate world in New York. I returned to South Carolina in 1990 Essentially because all of my siblings were here and I missed them and my mother had passed away in 1989 and I needed that connection. When I came back, um, uh, someone said to me, what are you going to do, Jane? And I said, lay on the couch. And not, but I was not able to retire yet. Um, but one day, one of my former teachers came and knocked on my door and I was literally laying on the couch. And she says, I need you to help us save Butler High School. And Butler High School is my former high school. And so I asked, what do you need me to do? She says, I need you to go on the radio tomorrow and tell people why the school district should not sell Butler to Walmart. And I'm like, okay. So I went on the radio the next day, told people why they should the school district should not sell Butler and was immediately launched into what has become my historic preservation career. I am a business person by nature and by training. So, but I love this work. And so it, shortly after that in 1993, when the commission was created, I was one of the 
uh, charter members that was appointed. So back in 1992, um, while I was trying to preserve my high school, the um, Department of Archives and History had its preservation conference in Charleston. And at that time, George, George Vogt was the director of the Department of Archives and History. Um, they had brought together a group of people to talk about historic African-American historic preservation. And at that meeting were representatives from Alabama, Florida, and Georgia. And they all had what they call African-American Preservation Network. And there were a number of us who were invited to, for a round table discussion about what should be done in South Carolina. Following that, we had several meetings and we decided that we were not interested in being any kind of ad hoc committee, that we wanted to be legally created by the General Assembly. So we uh, lobbied the General Assembly for what we called at that time, the South Carolina African American Heritage Council. And in 1993, the General Assembly passed a, a joint resolution creating the South Carolina African American Heritage Council. We were the first in the nation. There are several other um, states that have commissions now, North Carolina and Virginia, but we were the first to have a full-fledged commission appointed by the, we were appointed originally by the governor of South Carolina. So that's kind of our history. Uh, wow, um, that, uh, that is fascinating. Um, so there are two other states, as you noted, um, but. Well, there are two other states that have commissions. Other states have networks. Georgia has the network. Um, Alabama's network is kind of defunct now, but during that time, Georgia, Alabama, South Carolina, um, Tex, not Tex, Tennessee, Louisiana, uh, Arkansas, and Florida all had loose not uh, organizations that were formed but not by the General Assembly mm -hmm. so working with the National Trust for Historic Preservation we created a network of African-American preservation statewide organizations and those are the states that were included oh, and, wow. um, and of course now the, the three have commissions okay Oh, that's really fascinating. Um, it's great to hear the National Trust too, as it was a partner in that. We we know them well. Um, Ms. Harriet, I understand uh, one of the commission's initiatives includes um, the South Carolina Green Book of uh, significant African American heritage and cultural destinations in the state. Um, can you tell us a little bit more about that? I'd love for Ramon to talk about it. He loves this project. He came on board just as we were, <laughs> were <laughs> launching it. So I'm going to let him tell you about the okay, so this. Is, this is very recent then. <laughs> oh, yes. Um, huh? Now, I want to make sure I get this right. The, the Green Book of South Carolina launched in 2017. Is that correct, Janie? Right. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, and this is an online uh, mobile tourist guide uh, that folks can uh, use on their phones, on their computers. Uh, to explore over 400 um, African-American historic places, cultural tourism destinations, um, historic schools, cemeteries, you name it, um, from the comfort of their own home, or they can create walking or driving tours, uh, you know, for their vacations, family reunions, uh, genealogical research trips, uh, or school tr field trips. Um, there are a variety of different uh, uses for the, for the website. Um, what attracted me to the project uh, was that the name of the website is an homage to the original Negro Motorist Green Book, uh, which has become increasingly well known and, and popular um, after its heyday during the Jim Crow era uh, as a travel guide for African Americans who were uh, visiting places in the South if they were returning for family reunions or vacations or business trips uh, in other parts of the country as well. Um, and so what attracted me to the project was the potential of um, building an additional um, kind of hub where we could profile and share the stories of extant historic spaces that were once listed in the Negro Motorist Green Book around the state. 
Um, since joining uh, Archives and History uh, in February of last year, um, I was able to get the support of a professor at the University of South Carolina, Dr. Bob Wyneth, who's well known in uh, the National Council of Public History and other kind of preservation circles. Uh, and he enlisted some students to start conducting research on many of these extant historic spaces uh, that hadn't really received a lot of attention uh, for a variety of different reasons. Uh, and so I'm proud to say uh, that by the end of this year, I expect even with the kind of backlog that's been created by the pandemic, uh, I expect that we'll finally have at least five or six of these uh, extant historic sites um, either in line for listing on the National Register of Historic Places uh, or actually listed. Um, and so our goal is to get as many of these uh, on the National Register as we can uh, and hopefully build an addition to our, our current Green Book site uh, that will share the history of these spaces uh, and maybe even offer uh, 360 geolocative tours of some of these extant buildings so people can get a sense of uh, not only the historic uh, value of these spaces but maybe even uh, become motivated to create their own local movements to preserve these spaces and restore them for future use. Um, so I'm tremendously excited about this. Uh, Janie often says that it, it's kind of one of those things, I, it's all I talk about. Uh, she she kind of, you know, needles me sometimes to say that the commission is more than the Green Book, uh, but I, I, I completely understand. But this is just one of those things that, you know, attracted me to the archives. Um, and, 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 you know, I'm, I'm really excited about the direction that this is headed. Um, and and I, I know the public will be, uh, once they see the fruits of all of this research and, and, and uh, creativity uh, on the back end. So uh, that's one of those really great projects um, that we're involved in. How has the, the Green Book been received? Have there been any surprises or uh, new things discovered that may have been sort of hidden in plain sight? And in, in How much time do you have? I know, this, it's such a fascinating <laughs> topic. Um, <laughs> I can tell you, um, I can, I have been on more television shows and more radio and newspaper articles. Um, even I got a call from Japan. Um, it has, it has, I mean, it was overwhelming. It was overwhelming. And the fact that before Ramon came on board at the Department of Archives and History last year in February, for 27 years, we've operated as an all-volunteer organization. Um, we were able to lobby the General Assembly last year, I mean, in 2018, to um, provide funding in the Department of Archives and History's budget for a staff person strictly for African-American history and culture. Um, we felt that there was a need because basically, um, um, we didn't have people at the Department of Archives and History who understood the experiences of African Americans. And that's not to say that people can't, it's just you have to walk in our shoes. You have to live our life. You have to know who we are and our experiences, especially with some of the requests that might come. When, when people go to the archives and history to do genealogy re research, they need to have someone there who can relate to what they're looking for. So we were real happy about having Ramon there. But all of this work was done by volunteers. Wow, that explains so much um, how it was just such a neat find um, locating this entity via <laughs> Twitter and, um, and you know, the pioneering you did to get this created um, is really um, something that I'm sure a lot of other states um, will note uh, because it's, it's never an easy journey, that's for sure. And I've, after, you know, how many decades we now have Ramon. Um, well, I mean, well, um, and we, oh. we had a staff person um, for about two years before, mm -hmm. um, but the Department of Archives and History decided they could no longer fund that position so that position was and would you talk when you mentioned other states uh when north Car north carolina's commission was created 
based on our legislation. Mm -hmm. And so I was asked to come to North Carolina to train their staff. Um, I've been out to Texas to talk to them about establishing an African American Heritage Commission in Texas. I've gotten calls from other states um, because um, many people see the value in having a statewide organization. There are a lot of local groups that work on history, African American Mm -hmm. history and culture, but to have a concerted statewide effort there, uh, you know, very few states have that. Mm-hmm. And, and to I'm give you some perspective, I mean, you know, one of the things that also makes um, the commission unique is is that, you know, they've been able to kind of advocate uh, for the preservation of these spaces uh, in ways that other states have not. Um, if you look at the statistics just this year alone, uh, the number of African American historic spaces listed on the National Register uh, here in South Carolina have tripled. Um, and that's due in large part to the work of the commission and their collaboration with the staff in, the, uh, in SHPO. Um, and then we've also had, um, again, over 400 uh, African American historic sites uh, commemorated with historical markers. Uh, the vast majority of those um, were erected after the uh, founding of the commission uh, in 1993. So um, the proof is in the pudding. Um, the commission's existence has has really profited historic preservation, uh, particularly in African American communities in South Carolina. Uh, and we would definitely encourage other states to consider restarting uh, commission uh, uh, networks or, or building their own commissions. Um, because, you know, I think there's there's a real need for it. And, and you'd be surprised uh, how many folks out there would be interested in advocating for preserving their local church, preserving their schools, preserving their neighborhoods, uh, if you just asked um, and gave them some direction on how to build something like this uh, from the ground up. Uh, it takes a lot of work, uh, but it's worth it. Um, and we've seen uh, this type of work bear fruit here in South Carolina, for sure. Because as, as Ramon mentioned, when we were created in 1993, there were only 36 sites listed in the National Register of Historic Places or had a historical marker, 36. And today there are more, almost 500. There are almost 500. We don't take credit for erecting those markers. We take credit for raising the awareness of how important it is to have those markers. Mm -hmm. So Dr. Jackson, right now, People can't use the Green Book to go visit the um, African American historic uh, historic sites in South Carolina. What are you doing um, to keep people engaged in African American history and culture? Well, it, it's it is tricky to be to be frank. Um, we we definitely rely heavily on our social media presence right now. Um, if anyone is interested in in following us and, and our work. Uh, we have several accounts. Uh, we have the uh, commission account at SCAAHC1993. Uh, we have the foundation account, the Green Book of South Carolina uh, yes. website, uh, Green Book of SC, which is operated by our colleague, John Dawson House. Um, so we, we try to share uh, regularly information about uh, current events related to historic preservation and public history uh, and the field of history in general. Uh, we also share um, kind of samples from the Green Book website to kind of attract attention uh, there. Uh, Students, teachers, uh, diverse audiences have used our website in a variety of different ways during the pandemic. Um, I've noticed a lot of homeschooling parents have used our site um, and and commented about uh, its effectiveness as a tool for teaching history and social studies um, related to South Carolina's African American history uh, to their kids. Um, So, you know, it's still a useful site, even if you can't create a walking or a driving tour, um, you can get some real quality information about the African American past there. Um, But I think most importantly right now, our big push has been to collect uh, stories of African Americans around the state related to the ongoing pandemic. Uh, We have a project called uh, Portraits of a Pandemic, which is a pilot project for a larger oral history initiative that we plan uh, to to start uh, called Black Carolinians Speak. Uh, And so we've shared some stories 
uh, that folks have been willing to uh, have us broadcast on social media. Uh, we regularly promote uh, that project. And uh, I, I'm proud to say that uh, every day we've received at least one submission uh, from an African-American resident to kind of share their story. Uh, and we are also regularly conducting oral history interviews. Um, and again, all of this is done by volunteers. Um, had to create a basic set of guidelines for oral histories. Uh, I'm, I'm pretty much available 24 seven to answer questions from folks and they are knocking it out of the ballpark. These interviews are excellent. Um, and and I, I imagine by the time this project ends in October, um, we're gonna have a very unique uh, collection um, uh, that really shares the, the, the broad swath of the community and how they've gone through this public health crisis. Um, and we've done all of this just using uh, the tools at our disposal. Um, so it is possible and, and we'd encourage others uh, to consider similar work uh, wherever they may be. Uh, why is it important to um, preserve historic sites, um, especially those of African-American significance? Um, the word preserved can be very broad. And so um, I'm very curious about um, you know, the specific sites or the story behind them, how, how you well, do let, that. Let me tell you, okay. Number one, it's important that our children know whose shoulders they're standing on. It's important that our children understand the rich history of the, the people who came to South Carolina and built this state. I quite often tell people, I have a hundred, well now it's 177, just had a new one last week. Um, nieces, nephews, four generations. I want them to understand their roots. They live all over the country, some of them even out of the country, but I still want them to know my roots in South Carolina and my people were important to this state and they have made major contributions to this state and to this country. Um, I quite often, I have to always talk about my famous nephew, Michael Harriet at theroot.com, but it's, he understands where he came from. And so it's important for us to mark those places so that they can go back to those places and see, this is where my ancestor was. This is where my aunt, my grandfather, my mother, whoever. And these are the contributions that they made to the world that I live in today. Um, and Ramon, I'm sure has some other comments about that. Yeah, absolutely. And, and uh, in case you can't tell, I'm from off. Um, but my roots are, are growing every day uh, here in South Carolina. I'm proud to say I'm, I'm a father of a Carolina girl, uh, married to a Carolina girl from Berkeley County. Um, and I echo those sentiments. Um, it's extremely, extremely important to me. It's become my life work uh, to tell as many people as I can um, these fascinating stories of people in, in a place that they might not think a lot of, but they should think more highly of. Um, South Carolinians have changed the world in a variety of ways, uh, large and small. And, uh, you know, by preserving these spaces, um, we kind of open the door for those conversations. Um, one of the things that struck me about the National Register in particular when I first joined was just the lack of attention given to African American historic spaces nationwide. There just aren't as many listed on that, on that register as there should be. And I think one of the reasons for that is that many of our spaces are not architecturally unique. Um, they're not going to, you know, jump out at you. You're not going to take photos of them, uh, you know, like the Cathedral at Notre Dame, for example. You're not going to have a GoFundMe that raises billions of dollars to rescue a local barbershop, right? Um, but it's essential for us to collect these oral histories because that's where the uniqueness of those spaces lies. Uh, it's the people. Um, and so until public historians and historic preservationists start to kind of think more critically about these spaces and the need to preserve them um, and, and to do it by capturing the stories of the people who dwelt within, we're not going to scratch the surface in terms of telling a fuller American story. Um, and, and, you know, that's been my mission since joining archives and that'll be my life's work uh, un until I'm buried in, in, in the sand beneath my feet. Um, and so I'm, I'm, 
proud of what the commission has done and I'm honored to be a part of that. Uh, and thank you guys for having us today. Well, well we are, um, we are lucky to have you today and it's just, it's so wonderful to meet you for this and I hope we can stay in touch. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Yes. Thank you so much. On behalf of Chairman Giordani uh, and myself, Dr. Jackson and Ms. Harriet, thank you so much. And uh, I hope that uh, uh, you continue with your quest. It sounds uh, really um, significant, uh, like you're making a real significant dent in, uh, in, in helping people understand the heritage of African Americans in, in South Carolina and also inspiring other states around the nation. So again, thank you for joining us, and I hope that everyone continues to check out the ACHP's website and social media for our National Historic Preservation Month uh, activities. Thank you.